Look into a sterling motor car, luxuriously appointed with handcrafted wood, rich in supple Connolly leather. Back in 1987, a new car called the Sterling first hit the North American luxury car market, imported from Britain as a rebadged Rover 800, which itself was built in collaboration with Honda. Touted as having classic British style, combined with Japanese build quality and reliability, the Sterling quickly earned a reputation for having little quality or reliability, resulting in it being dropped from the U.S. and Canada markets just four years later. This is the story of a car called the Sterling. This is my old car. No matter how you look at it, it's time to see what it's like to drive a Sterling. Thanks for the many suggestions to review the Sterling, a long since forgotten car of the 80s, which definitely fits this channel as a car which is very rare to find today. If you are a child of the 90s or later, there is a very good chance you have never heard of a car called the Sterling. So although my audience is typically older, I won't be surprised if almost no one in their 30s or younger is even watching this episode. But I definitely remember this car. Certainly not a car I wanted to own, as I could barely afford any car when the Sterling was new. But more of a curiosity, and thought at the time the reason there were so few around was because they must have been very expensive, and therefore really good cars. I have since learned that just because a car is expensive, it doesn't mean it's a great car. The history of the Sterling began with British automaker Rover. Rover was one of several marks, or brands, under the former British Leyland Motor Corporation. Their other marks were much more well known in North America, especially Jaguar, Land Rover, and Mini. But they also had a strong American following, although with a lower volume, with cars such as the Austin and MG. In 1982, a major restructuring of British Leyland resulted in the splitting up of its car production into the Austin Rover Group and the Land Rover Group, and Jaguar becoming an independent company once again, having been in business since 1922, but had been part of British Leyland since 1966. But the Rover's presence in North America was much smaller, so much so that probably only serious car nuts in America back then even knew they existed. In 1968, Austin Rover began imports of a luxury sedan to America called the 3500, or, as the British would call it, an executive saloon called the 3005. Although it was powered by a V8 originally designed by General Motors for Buick, its European styling didn't catch on in America, and imports ended by 1971. Rover tried again in 1980, this time with their SD1 model that they had been selling in Europe since 1976. This import to America was attempted despite the fact that by then, the SD1 had earned a reputation for poor build quality, especially its large panel gaps in the doors. That's quite a big panel gap you've got there. That is quite a gap. Although the SD1, which still used the 3500 name in America, initially got good reviews and was priced competitively against rivals from Mercedes and BMW, they only sold 480 cars in 1980 and 774 cars in 1981, the latter mostly being unsold cars from 1980. By the end of 1981, Rover cut their losses and ended shipments of the SD1 to America. After two failed attempts to get a Rover model to sell in America, their third attempt would be to export their new Rover 800 series, a full-size sedan which replaced the Rover SD1. The new Rover 800 series, engineering in a finer form. This new model, which would later become the Sterling in America, had been co-developed with Honda. Back then, Honda's largest car was the Accord which was considered a mid-sized model at the time, although early Accords are more likely to be considered a compact by today's standards. Joint development of the new model began in 1981, with Honda's version being called a Legend, except in America it wouldn't be sold as a Honda, and instead would become the first flagship of Honda's new luxury division, Acura. Sales of the Legend began in 1985 for the 1986 model year, and sold over 25,000 units in America that first year enough to encourage Rover that they could try selling the similar 800 series in America as well. But due to the poor reception of their last two models, they decided their third attempt would not sell under the Rover name. Instead, they chose the name Sterling, which was the name Rover used for the top luxury saloon model of the 800 series in Europe. Those who knew American taste back then also agreed that the name Sterling sounded much more like a British luxury car to Americans. Both the Legend and the first Sterling model, the 825, shared the same Honda-built 2.5-liter V6 engine, rated at 151 horsepower, which was the first V6 engine Honda ever developed. So as to not directly compete against one another, changes were made to the springs and dampers to give the Sterling a more sports car ride, as opposed to Legend's more comfort tune ride. 
although oddly, the tires on the Sterling were higher profile and skinnier than on the Legend. Sterling, the dream is born. Buyers of the Sterling's higher-end SL trim were also greeted with a Connolly leather interior and genuine burled walnut wood trim. A six-speaker Philips audio system was also standard. Yes, six speakers was a lot for one car back then. This, along with the Honda engine and some of the design and engineering of the car being Japanese, Rover knew that it would be a great selling point in America, where Japanese imports were gaining huge ground among their domestic rivals. But there were other key differences between the Legend and Sterling that not all buyers may have realized. Whereas the US sold Acura Legend was built in Japan, the Sterling 825 was built alongside the 800 at Rover's Cowley plant in Oxford, England. This resulted in a big difference in build and paint quality, which became clear after numerous complaints from customers during the 825's first model year. Some of the components in the British-built Sterling were sourced by Lucas Electrics, which already had a dubious reputation in other British cars. Another key difference was how the cars were sold. The Legend had the Honda Motor Company to back up their new Acura dealer network in America. Sterling, on the other hand, had no such dealer network. The result was the creation of a new company called the Austin Rover Cars of North America, or Arcona. Except that Austin Rover didn't own Arcona. It instead was owned by wealthy U.S. car dealership owner Norman Brahman. 135 dealers were initially sourced to sell the Sterling, projecting sales of 30,000 cars in 1987 alone. Luckily, Austin Rover didn't send over nearly that many, as they ended the year with less than half of that projection, just over 14,000 sold. Thanks in part to poor ratings in J.D. Power surveys, sales of the 825 in 1988 dropped to under 9,000, which was especially troubling considering that the Japanese-built Acura Legend had managed to reach over 70,000 cars sold that same year. Many of the quality issues had been resolved by 1989, but the damage to their reputation had already been done. In an effort to get sales back on track, improvements were also made to the Honda V6, now increasing its size to 2.7 liters and 10 more horsepower, resulting in the car's name changing to the 827. They also added a hatchback model, called the 827 SLI, but the combined sales of sedans and hatchbacks dropped below 6,000 in 1989. Their last remaining attempt to boost sales came in 1990, with a limited 350-unit run of the 827 sedan called the Oxford Edition. These cars had even more leather and wood trim in every possible option available back then, which included its own built-in cellular phone. This, of course, was back when cell phones could only do one thing, make phone calls. But that was a big deal in 1990. 1990 sales dropped to just over 4,000 cars sold, despite all the improvements made with the 827 model. There were simply too many problems with cars built during its first couple years, and that is what the public remembered. It didn't help that by this point, Lexus and Infiniti had also joined the luxury car market, which, just like Acura had Honda, had their parent companies Toyota and Nissan already well established in America to back them up. By August of 1991, with only 2,700 cars sold, Austin Rover officially announced that Sterling would no longer be sold in America. However, back in England, the Rover 800, despite the fact that it was built alongside the Sterling in the same Oxford factory, sold much better, being the UK's best-selling executive car for eight years, where it competed with the Granada and Scorpio from Ford, and the Carlton from GM's European division, Vauxhall. The 800 was redesigned in 1991 to have a more aerodynamic look, compared to the very 80s square look of the previous model, and continued to sell well until it was replaced in 1999 by the Rover 75. Existing Sterling owners were not totally out of luck when it came to maintaining their now orphan cars, thanks to the many parts that were interchangeable with other Acura and Honda models, which helped keep the old cars going long after the original Sterling parts supply dried up. But there were still a lot of Rover-specific parts, whose scarcity led to the inevitable conclusion that despite almost 36,000 Sterling sold over five years, very few are still on the road today. If you still own a Sterling, it's not likely a daily driver anymore. But if you own the Oxford Edition, let us know if that cell phone still works. No, it's not a pay phone! It's a portable phone! Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. So we don't think Austin Rover will have any trouble finding buyers for the 30,000 cars they plan to import this year. Don't!